This is Simon Howard, and he's going to ask the question, are Windows listening? So give him a nice applause so we can get a bit welcome in here. Yeah, that better? Okay, yeah. So I had it on mute. Okay, I'm, I'm Simon Howard. I'm from a little country called New Zealand. Um, I'm going to be talking about are the vendors listening? So this is a look inside the magic quadrant, and that's the Gartner magic quadrant. I'll talk about that a bit later. Okay, so I'm a security engineer, and I work for a large MSSP, which is a managed security service provider in New Zealand. Uh, large by New Zealand standards is like 20,000 users. So in Europe, I think we're just like, it's like your home basement sort of MSSP. Um, started life as a coder, uh, and now I like building things like big managed services, and I like breaking them as well, so it's fun. And I also like burnouts. Okay, so what the whole idea for my talk or uh, looking at content SMTP filtering products was, there's lots of great research, research being done in the community. So we've got like uh, Ofa Erkin who was talking about the, the bypassing Next solutions uh, yesterday or today, I think. Um, PTAC and Newsham, they've done lots of work on IDS evasion and uh, denial of service. Um, Caswell and HD Moore, they did uh, more IDS bypass techniques that you could use on your IDSs that you buy to see how good they actually are. Uh, and Anton Rager did a lot of work on breaking various IC implementations. So what I did was a guy called, I, was, I did this talk in New Zealand or a similar one about, um, and I, I couldn't pronounce his name, I was saying three papa, or, and a, a Russian guy came out of the audience and go, oh, his name is Z Raza, and that's how, so I got that pronunciation sorted for today. Um, he released a paper in 2002 called Bypassing Content Filtering Software, or Bypassing Content Filtering. Um, Mark, a couple of guys called Marks and Ackerman, they, I think they work for Virus Bulletin. Um, in 2002, they took uh, Ziraz's original paper and they wrote up like 500 or so test cases and sent it out to 43 different vendors. And these are techniques to get past the vendor's content filtering engines, right? They sent them all out and then they waited six months and then they published all the responses from the vendors. And all the vendors were like, yes, we're going to patch this or coming out on the next release and we've tested all your filtering bypass techniques and nope, they don't work on our products. So after a while, Ziraza, he updated his paper. Now it rolls along, it's 2007. And I thought, well, surely all these vendors, all their products are going to be secure as because these techniques from back in 2002 may have been updated a bit, but they'll be keeping an eye on this white paper. They'll be like W getting it every five minutes and doing an MD5 sum to make sure it hasn't changed from 2002. Um, so I took it and then I ran it against some SMTP filtering products to see what the story was. So Zeraz's original paper mentions a few vulnerable clients, but mainly it's a brain dump of bypass techniques. It isn't like specifically saying on Semantic, on Ironport, on Clear Swift, these techniques work. It's just saying, here's some techniques, they may work, I'm not sure. Some people have tried them. So I wanted a focused test set of products, and so I chose products that have got a place in the Gartner Magic Quadrant. And what the Gartner Magic, or what Gartner do is, if your product has sold lots and lots of copies and it's worth millions of dollars, then you may be able to, you may be, uh, Gartner may come to you and say, we want to include you in our Magic Quadrant, and they'll analyze your product and see how well it does spam filtering and virus filtering and how adept your content filtering engine is at stripping attachments and doing other fancy tricks. So this quadrant is broken down into four quarters. There's the leaders, which was semantic and iimport that I chose. There's a lot more other than these, but these are the main ones I chose. Um, some visionaries, challenges, and there's also niche players, but I didn't want, uh, an example of a niche player is Senmail, and I, you're lost anyway if you're using Senmail. 
Uh, a quotable quote from this paper that I particularly like. Uh, the market is defined by vendors that provide enterprise protection against inbound email threats and fulfill outbound policy requirements at the SMTP gateway. So that's a quote out of their report for that year. I think in uh, quarter one, 2008, perhaps they're releasing the next um, version of this paper. And they don't just do it for email security products, they do it for IDS and disk encryption and yeah, lots of different products. Okay, so I needed a method to do my testing with. So I needed a file type to prove if the attachment stripping techniques were working or not. Uh, VBS came across as a good one because you can't do true type file detection on it. It doesn't start with a magic header like MZ. Uh, it's, it's just source code basically in a file and it's not like Perl or Python or something where you got your shebang and then you got user bin in for Python. Yeah, it's just some plain text that is default executable on Windows. So here's my wee test script here. Hello world. What I then did was installed and configured each of the products. So I chose eight different SMT boundary filtering products, as you saw before from my Gartner. Uh, they are selected from the Gartner quadrants. And I configured each of them as per the user documentation to strip or to um, deliver filtered messages to Postfix. So it would strip the attachment. I set it up strip. Start up VBS, or maybe on the product will have like malicious attachment stripping, and that includes VBS. So I'll tick that box, or maybe I have to write some custom filters, but the documentation tells me how to do this. So I'll go along those lines, configure it how any normal user would do it. That was my goal. Then pump all the test cases in, and then retrieve the filtered messages with my mail clients and see what the result was. And I was hoping that I wouldn't see anything. I was hoping it's going to be stripped attachments across the board. Well, I wasn't really hoping that because then I wouldn't ever talk. Okay, so here's a, a wee diagram of the environment. Message comes in, attachment stripped pops into Postfix and then I've got a POP3 client on there, Dovecot, and I pull it out with the email clients and I've got Malform Mail. Okay, so the products that I tested, before I said, it, so here's the exact versioning. If you've got these at home, then you can follow along. Proofpoint, they're pretty cool because they give you a VMware virtual image. So for testing purposes, I had VMware set up and then I'd have Red Hat Enterprise Linux and then I'd have a Debian and then I'd have a Windows XP and a Windows 2003 because each of the products, they don't, one of them may not work on XP, might like 2003 better. So I had to go across the board, but Proofpoint, you just chuck the VMware image into VM Player and crank it up and you can do your testing. It's great. I import. You actually need one of their appliances, so it's a bit harder. But luckily we're friends with Ironport, so they gave me one to test. Yeah, and they are the vendors there. Now the email clients. Because I'm fiddling around with attachment file name extensions and the way that it's rendered, sometimes they aren't going to be visible in all the clients, which I'll show you and explain to you later. But I Outlook Express, Thunderbird. Um, I completely forgot about Outlook 2007 because our standard build on our desktops at work was still uh, Windows 2000 at the time. But I would like to test it sometime. I'm pretty sure it's fairly the same as Outlook 2003. They hadn't changed much in the rendering engine there. And of course, dirty old Lotus Notes. Okay, the control file. So this is what the control file looked like. to so that I could send it through the engine and test that the attachment stripping was working as intended. So I just used, um, I'm not, unfortunately I'm not a Python zealot like a number of people here today. I love my Perl. Let's see, I have a show of hands for Perl programmers here. Terrible. So I used the Perl Mime Light libraries and um, constructed up this email. You can see here, this is um, Base64 encoded Hello World. Well, it's not actually Hello World. It was some other VBS script that I nicked off the internet, but it, it's not malicious. It just pops up a message box and says something. Okay, and close up, this is what it looks like. So you, you've got your content disposition and your attachment file name equals VBS. And then you've got your content type, application octet, team, octet stream, 
file.vbs. So it's basically telling the email client and the filtering product that there's a VBS file in that email. Now, I needed to modify this various ways to, as according to Zeraz's paper to get past the SMT filtering products. Um, I based 64 and quoted printable and coded the file name. I injected a few nulls here and there, sort of on, along the same lines of Brett Moore's same bug different app stuff. Um, and then I removed non-vital sections of the mime. So here's a list from Zeraz's original paper of all the different modifiers that I attempted. So we've got encoded file names, multiple file names, null bytes, unsafe if gets, trying to do buffer overflows. None of the clients were susceptible to that, thankfully. Um, UU encoding, changing the case sensitivity is something as simple as that. Uh, missed mine version, so I'll go through these in a bit more depth. Okay, so out of, I, initially I had about 118, I think, I can't remember the exact number of test emails, and then I had to, I cut that down to 58 really solid test cases. For some of them, uh, the email attachment, like with the control file, it would be stripped by all products. So I'm not gonna bother including that in my test results because all the email clients can render it and all the content filtering products can strip it. Similarly, if I've got a test case that none of the email clients can render, then there's no point including it because it's not going to be uh, a malicious file. And I got some fairly interesting results. Okay, so we'll start with the content disposition and fiddling around with the way the file name is represented within inside the email. So there's some pretty simple things that I did here. Normally, your file.vbs is represented inside quotes or ticks. I took those ticks off. I put the ticks at the front. I put an extra dot in front of things. Uh, I took the ticks out completely, put one tick in there. This uh, US ASCII uh, is a character set and then Q is quoted printable, but then I didn't quote it printable my file name. So that if it was quoted printable, it would be equals and then the quoted printable thing for an F, but I just put it in there straight out. And the same with base64, that's not base64 encoded, that's just plain text. So the results of how the email filtering products interpret these names and how the email clients interpret these names is what I'll show next. Okay, so this is for test case number one, content disposition. I'll go into this in closer detail because it's quite hard to see from afar. But the white dots, on the, on the left hand side you've got five email clients and on the right hand side you've got the eight F, um, filtering products. So if you've got a white square in the email filtering product side, that means the detachment isn't valid, it, it can't see it basically. And likewise on the right hand side if you've got a white square it means the detachment wasn't stripped. So there's a, there's a few dots in there, so it's kind of interesting. Let's have a look at it closer. So here's just the first four test cases. In the email clients, the first two test cases, which were, if we go back here, file.vbs, and with and without the quotes, it was rendered successfully. Test case number three, Outlook Express, Outlook 2000, Outlook 2003. They all rendered that attachment successfully, but in Lotus Notes and Mozilla Thunderbird, they didn't know what to do with it. So test case number three is with the two quotes at the start. So, okay, that's kind of interesting. And on test case number four, Notes knew what to do with it, but Thunderbird was still lost. And this is what the invalid attachment would perhaps look like. Now these aren't from, this is from test case 15 as you can see in the subject line, but it just looks mangled. It's a tilde and a, a, a bracket and a um, carrot, so you're not being, going to be able to double click on that and execute the VBS code. Similarly in notes, what a beautiful email client it is. You can see here the file name is just some kind of crazy dat file. And yeah, that's not VBS. Hands up here who uses Lotus Notes as an email client. By choice? No. <laughs> yeah. Look at that. Simple, nice, clean, terrible. 
And if the email attachment is valid, it's going to look like this, file.vbs. Simple. So from the other side of the graph, how we had the big, or the big um, diagram there before, we see here with those two, first two test cases, all the products stripped them, no worries. But as soon as we started playing with it a little bit more, remember we had the two ticks in the front filed at VBS, proof point, oh, what do I do with that? I'll just let it through. Similarly, Trend Micro, Surf Control, Sophos Pure Message, we'll just let that through. Now, if this was a executable file, like file.exe, and it had the MZ header, then the chances are these products are going to be able to strip it because they're just looking for the MZ pattern. As soon as they see that, they look inside the mine boundaries. Here's where the attachment sits. I'm going to pull it straight out. But because it can't do any file type checking, it's got to rely on looking for that attachment extension name to strip the file. And it's seeing these double quotes and going, what, there's no file name at all. And it just lets it through. Okay, and this is what it looks like, as you'd expect when the attachment is stripped. Okay, so the next thing I did, or one of the other test cases, was a different file name. So here, in the content disposition, we've got test.txt, and in the content type, we've got test.file.vbs. Now what's the email client going to do with that? Is it going to render it as test.txt, which I'll be able to double click on it, but it won't be a VBS file, it'll just be the VBS code. Or will it show me file.vbs? Similarly, file.vbs and test.txt in the opposite order. Um, I also had it pointed out to me that if you flip content type and content disposition actually around, so the first line is content type and the second line is content disposition, that also fools the clients and the filtering software or more so the filtering software than the clients, or how about having two content dispositions? Yeah, that also messes with it. But I didn't test that, I just got told it after the fact. Okay, so test case one, we've got test.txt file at VBS, and Outlook Express, it's choosing the VBS file, so it's choosing the second one. So is Outlook 2000, 2003. Lotus Notes and Thunderbird, they play with test case two, though, so they choose the one out of the content disposition rather than the content type. So there's some interesting results here. The iImport developers seem to be using Thunderbird or Lotus Notes as an email client to test these things. So they're thinking, oh, this attachment isn't visible in Thunderbird, so why should we strip it, perhaps? Or maybe they're just not even thinking about stripping it. The likes of Mail Marshall and Trend Micro, they, they know that there's a, a malicious VBS file in there somewhere perhaps, so they strip both lots. Semantic, I think they're all away on holiday when all this stuff was going on, because they don't strip anything there. Okay, Nullbyte. <clears throat> this is a, another same bug, different app. So I've got, you can see here on the right hand side, we've got file.vbs and then I'll put a null in here and then we've got .text. So what's the content filtering product going to do with that? Is it going to read that string in and as soon as it hits the null it's going to go, oh this is a malicious VBS file, I'm going to strip it. Or is it going to read the whole string in and think, oh this is a text file, I'm going to let it through. Similarly, is the email client going to read it all in and think, I've oh, hit the null, that's it, fold at VBS. So you really have to think, or well, that email client is going to probably do something different from the SMTP filtering product. So here's the results of that. So it's a bit, there's quite a few gaps in there. Um, you can see with test case number two, uh, that I think, I'm not sure which test case, this might have been test case number one or two. No, it was number two. Lotus Notes didn't like it, but all the other clients did. Uh, Mel Marshall, he must have been reading right the end to the text file. Yeah, but it's still, it's rendered in that client. Similarly there in test case number five, none, sometimes I was base64 encoding the null or quoted printable encoding the null. Um, I fiddled around with it a whole bunch. 
so you can see it'll be fine lotus notes quite a few banks especially in new zealand use lotus notes so it's quite a good target um surf control that strips it and it looks like code theft and reuse isn't a problem I yep Yes, yeah. So with the null byte one here, there was seven test cases. Number one was originally, um, it was stripped by all vendors or and it didn't render in all clients. So this is just one of the test case examples. I did modify it seven different times using different flipping and such. Yeah. And the thing about code theft and reuse, normally if code theft and reuse was a problem, you'd see some vendors would have exactly the same results as the others for all of the test cases. So I've got the accompanying white paper here, which will be available on DeepSec website and on my website. And you would assume for all the test cases here, if they're stolen, like the Sophos Pure Message Code is written in Perl, so you can easily download it and you can just turn it into your application. Um, but it, that doesn't seem to be happening here, which is a good thing. If I had probably looked at some Chinese products um, on, or some other country who are like stealing code perhaps, then you could see a bit of reuse, but it doesn't seem to be a problem. Um, simple bugs. So UU encode. We all, we all know what UU encode is. We've UU encoded file names before. This command first appeared in BSD4 in the 1980s, and these three vendors here can't strip UU encoded attachments. It's pretty poor. The strange thing is these are the three vendors that have Unix-based appliances. So you'd think they'd know Okay, so across the board, or across after I did all my test cases, 58 test cases, here's the results. So for the email clients, Thunderbird can render the most wacky, malformed, trippy email attachments with 72% success rate. And the old Outlook Express 6, it wasn't so flash in Outlook 2003. And Lotus Notes, that was the worst, or was it the best? should we be rendering these attachment file names? So I think the reason that a lot of these clients here are rendering these malformed attachments is due to broken applications. There's so many different applications out there that have been written poorly and um, we'll get, say it's a web server or something that's flicking out email notifications about website updates and it's got an attachment on it but it's a bit malformed um, someone's gone back to Microsoft and say, hey, I really need to read this attachment. Can you fix up your client so it works with it? And so that's what they probably have done, just to be nice to their users to, for user friendliness's sake. And there's also RFC compliance. Um, RFC 2231, for example, is a standard where you can have your file name, if it's longer than 255 characters, split up into multiple um, content dispositions. So you've got file name zero, like an array, equals the first 255 characters, then the second 255 characters. Now this RFC's been around um, maybe five or six years, but only Thunderbird's adopted it. It's kind of a strange one. And nearly, if we look at the, uh, the global results here, if we get down to RFC 2231, yeah. there we can see that only Thunderbird renders these attachments. Where my mouse point is gone. This line of ones here. And then only Ironport and I think the other one might have been Proofpoint can strip them. So it's a kind of a strange thing. I don't know why Thunderbird adopted it and installed it because there's perfectly valid workarounds for the problem. Okay, now look at the boundary security products. Now, a higher score here is better. You want to be stripping these attachments. We can see proof point and iron port, they're down below 50%, which is kind of bad. Um, so fast, yeah, 52%. And then we've got Clear Swift, a clear leader, <laughs> with 84. And then Trend Marco, 83. Not too bad. Okay, so what I did with these results, if you're familiar with the Gartner Magic Quadrant, you've got your as we had at the start, we've got the niche players and the visionaries and the leaders. So 
I was loath to what the salesperson would do with my results. They're going to say, oh, we got an 84% in Simon Howard's attachment stripping bypass filtering, blah, blah, blah. Um, so I conducted or constructed Necromancer's Quadrangle that they could use in their sales reports if they wanted, but they'd look kind of silly. So we've got Claire Swift up the top there. Those guys are pretty proactive. They're keeping an eye on Zeraza's bypass filtering paper and seeing what you guys are saying in the industry. Um, Trend Micro are good as well. Um, Monoroll, so the Surf Control and Sophos have got the deaf in one ear. They're kind of listening to what's going on. They've got some mitigation strategies there, but they're not really working on it. Amnesic, uh, Iron Port, Semantic Proof Point. All the way back in 2002, when Marks and Ackerman notified them of these issues, they responded to these guys saying, I think Ironport were the only one who weren't around back then, or they in a different guise. Um, they said, yeah, yeah, we've fixed it, we're keeping an eye on it, we've sorted it out. But in reality, they probably did it for those first test sets back in 2002. Come 2007, they, they're not really keeping an eye on it. And I can probably see people from that am amnesiac space moving into the reactive column as threats are realized, as viruses start using these techniques, and then popping back into the amnesiac column when they've fixed that problem, but they, they're not really forward thinking, not being proactive about it. So that's just a quick definition of those terms. So what are the implications for this? Well, viruses and lots of them. There's already been some viruses using these techniques in the wild. Sircam, Bad Trans, uh, Jibe, it's like some of them have had the multiple file name extension, like you've got filename.doc.exe. So they're kind of pretty basic, basic transforms on, on those bad attachment file names. Um, Pattern-based virus detection, we've already seen lots of great talks about why that doesn't work and why it's not going to stop this kind of thing. Heuristic and sandboxing may work to stop these threats because depending on how they pull out that attachment from inside the body of the email message, they may be able to execute and know, hey, you're calling these, um, why are you trying to connect to a website or send an email? But when you've got virus writers and you've got virustotal.com, you've got new viruses and new variants that are undetectable, basically, or that for the period of time will be undetectable. And we've seen examples of that today as well. All they need to do is set up, mod keep modifying them and sending them through virus total until it's undetectable. Or they can create a magic email. So get the content to, so look at the, go back to the um, PDF here. So if they don't really know what email client the target is using at the other end, they could choose um, a content disposition, one that gets past most of the filters, and a uh, multiple file name one, and put all those three malformed attachment names into one email, send it through, and chances are it's going to get your Lotus Notes, it's going to get your Outlook, it's going to get your Thunderbird, and it's going to get past all of the SMTP filtering products out there. So in conclusion, after looking at all those vendors and getting the results back, the majority of them aren't listening. We've got about a 50, 51% success rate across the attachment stripping techniques for these vendors. How do we make them listen? Like we pay a lot of money for these products. Take your business elsewhere or tell them it is an issue. Like for example, um, one of our vendors back home, I always beat them up and say, look at these bugs, look at these problems here. And they come, they come to us at the end of the end and say, hey, we'd like to raise the support contracts by um, $20,000. And I say, and I write up the paper of all my findings and all these bypass techniques and, and then send it over to them. And they're like, oh, yeah, you can stay in your current contract. Don't worry about it, extra 20 grand. So you have to make them listen. Or I could sell my research to the storm crew or post it on 29A, but that's just going to make more trouble for me because I'm the one at the end who has to deal with all this crap coming through my system. I wouldn't do that. Okay, so ideas for further research. Um, 
I'd like to test all the web-based email clients like Gmail. I did try Gmail with this test set and it's pretty damn good. So as soon as you're sending the email through, as soon as it sees that content disposition or type or that bad attachment name starting, just drops the connection, gives you a 500 back. Um, a few of them did get through and none of them were render renderable in Gmail email client itself, but the people who pop the email back off Gmail, then you could get them like that. I've got a friend who works for Google though, so I've told him about them and he'll patch them. And all the techniques I have discussed today, all the holes I found in all the vendors' products, they were notified about this about a month ago. And I won't be releasing my test cases into the wild unless someone specifically wants them. If any of the vendors here that I didn't test want them, then just let me know. I'd like to try out Hotmail and Yahoo. I tried Hotmail, but uh, they didn't like my IP address. They said I was a blacklisted or something. Kept dropping my messages. And Message Labs, they're an interesting one because they've got that 100% non-detectable virus sort of thing going on and that they'll give you your money back if you get some malicious code in your inbox. So is anyone here from Message Labs? Or well, does anyone here use Message Labs as an email provider? No. I'll be interested to try it and see if any of these malformed attachments come through. And I could al always add my test cases to Metasploit or Canvas or something. Probably won't do that though. Who knows? Okay, so the white paper is available there on my website, research.mints.ac.nz. And go forth and test your products. Are these, uh, are these test cases you developed online? Because I'd like to test that against uh, my setups, not using any of the commercial products, but it would be very yeah. nice to know. I haven't put them online me. because that just gives easy access for the script kiddies yeah, or course, the storm crew yeah. or something to just grab them and, and it's already pre-cooked for them. Even though all these techniques are detailed back in 2002 and it's in um, Zeroz's white paper, I haven't released them out in the public. Would, I'd make them work for their zero day. Eh? Would you uh, distribute, uh, send that, if, if I send you an yeah, email? Yeah, yeah, if you flick me an email so. and I think you're not a, going to be using them for bad purposes. No, and yeah, I don't. <laughs> yeah. I have a look at the white paper as well because that, yeah. yeah. Fine. Thanks. And beat your vendor up. Yeah. Hey, um, were there any test cases that got through all of the vendors' um, uh, filtering? Was there, was there anything that you found that bypassed everything? I think, and there was pretty much, and always there was one case where at least one vendor would pick it up. Right. Because I use eight eight vendors. Yeah, at least one case where there'd, there'd always be one vendor that picked it up. But in that case, if I did have a case where it went through all, it probably isn't going to be renderable in all the email clients. Sure. Yeah, but that's why you use a magic email with like multiple bad attachments on it. Yeah. And it'll get, yeah, it'll get. Or you can use SMTP scan as well, which is uh, some dudes from Grey Hat Security to fingerprint their mail service so you work out what it is. Send an email through, get a bounce back from notes, then you know they're using notes. Get a bounce back from exchange, you know they're using Outlook, and then use that as your Target, vector. Like that. Yeah. Cool. Any more questions? Um, so, um, have, um, like, do you really think that some of these vendors are actually listening to the security community? Uh, because, like, if people like Symantec was were listening to the security community, I think we we would have figured out for quite some time now. Um, my question is more, is their customers actually listening to the security community? Because when I look at the Simon Tech customer base, it's huge. And obviously these people, because I, I, I think their products are pretty crap, but they, they keep selling and selling and selling around yeah. and for years. And 
um, like what we see with Microsoft, like unless the client really get pissed off by the product, they won't change their way of selling no. the product. So, too, too many people take the stuff for granted. They just think because on their vendor's website it says 100% secure or no viruses, that it's going to do that. You. That's why you get people who employ them within your teams to go and do this research, send them off to hacker conferences like this one, computer security conferences. You need to have a person, at least one or two, in your team doing this kind of stuff, beating up your vendors, making sure. And But you are right that the majority of the cases, your clients, they, they don't know what's going on and they just blindly believe what you say and what your salesmen say to them. Yeah, yes. Yeah, going to conferences is great, but here in that room, I think we most IT security practitioners, hackers, yeah. and blah, 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 and we all convinced of, convinced of this fact, so we, yeah. we just keep talking among each other. Yeah. And the question is, it, when is the information is getting out, yeah. out of this? So maybe we're not targeting the right crowd mm. when we're just what? presenting our results, and me including, yeah, yeah. and my work as well. I mean, what? it's... What I'll, I'll do when I get back to New Zealand is run a, a, an overview of what every, all the presentations that I've been to here and give it to invite all of my staff on my floor, even if they're not security, even though if they don't know anything about it, and try and disseminate that knowledge across everyone. And that's what each of you need to do when you go back to your work, place of work. Give a rundown of this conference and say, hey, this is what went down. These are some different things to think about because a lot of things talked about at this conference are applicable in everyday life, like the e-voting talks and the, the healthcare, e-health talk. Yeah, you just, it's up to us as well to help spread this knowledge in the word. And it's kind of hard to get people as enthused about security as we are a lot of the time, but yeah. Good question though. Anyone else? That's fine to uh, contact all the companies, but how would you contact the home users? Well, it's up to the companies to protect the home users. It's not up to me to tell all the home users. Yeah. Yeah, but by the use oh. of their clients. Yeah, the clients, I can see. So Microsoft shouldn't be rendering these malformed attachments. So. But then, like what I said before, they've probably done it over a series of years ago to deal with some buggy email client or mal, uh, malformed email. So it, I don't see it as the email people who write email clients' fault. I see it as the um, email vendors' fault. Yeah. Thanks for letting me borrow your laptop too. <laughs> All right. If there, <coughs> if there aren't any more questions, I have to thank you for speaking here.